action, focus, discipline. This is the Zero Excuses Podcast. Each and every week, we talk to high-performing, inspirational athletes, entrepreneurs, and leaders. We ask powerful questions to extract their tools, strategies, and life lessons for you to crush your excuses, to break out of your comfort zone, and accomplish your ambitious dreams and goals. Here's your host, Kenyon Zitzka. What's going on, everyone? Welcome back to the podcast. Thank you for tuning in. Appreciate you guys taking time out of your schedule to join us here. We have an outstanding guest. Join us today. We have Commander Rourke Denver. He is a soon-to-be retired Navy SEAL. He is also a New York Times bestselling author and starred in the movie Act of Valor, which came out a few years ago. He's got a really, really interesting story. He also has a ton of combat leadership experience and we dive into some of the nuts and bolts of what he took from his service and is now helping other people, corporate clients, private uh, clients, uh, step out of their comfort zones and really live a purposeful life and much, much more. Before we get into the conversation with Rourke, have a couple quick reminders for you guys. First, if you haven't already done so, Would appreciate it if you go over to iTunes and leave us a rating and review and also subscribe and share the show with anybody who you think would uh, get value out of the subjects and strategies and tools that we talk about each and every week here. And secondly, if you want to explore these topics at a deeper level and want to really implement and make some positive changes in your life, I'm offering everybody in my audience the opportunity to connect with me for 15 minutes, whether you, like I said, want to explore one of these topics at a deeper level or simply just get to know me a little bit better. I'm down for all that. Just want to connect with as many of my audience members as possible. So you can go to kenyanzitska.com slash call, C-A-L-L, take you right to my calendar. You can book a time, spend 15 minutes on the phone with me. And also, if you head over to kenyanzitska.com slash group, that will take you to our Facebook page, and you can join the group there. We have close to 500 members there that are that are discussing these uh, very topics that we have on the uh, show each and every week, and we're just having a respectful, down-to-earth conversation about getting the most out of life, regaining control over our time, and building that discipline. So without any further ado, let's get into the conversation with work. Rourke Denver, thanks for taking time out of your schedule to join us on the Zero Excuses podcast. I know this has been in the works for for a little bit, so appreciate the patience and uh, glad we finally were able to get our schedules lined up here. Uh, Likewise. All right, so Rourke, you are a uh, soon-to-be-retired Navy SEAL, and uh, you did, what, 13 years active duty, and you're also a New York Times bestselling author, actor, all-star lacrosse player at uh, Syracuse University, my old stomping grounds in upstate New York. Yeah, man. Um, I'm probably forgetting something there, so why don't you uh, give yourself a quick introduction and uh, give us a 30,000-foot view of who you are. Yeah, of course. No, I'm commander in the, the SEAL teams, just like we discussed, 13 active years, finishing up my time in the reserves. I've got that done by this summer, so fast approaching the finish line, which is good. I'm ready to be uh, you know, untethered, but I've enjoyed every second of my time in service. Grew up in the Bay Area, California, athlete my whole life. Got recruited to play lacrosse back at Syracuse in, in Central New York, which uh, in that era was an absolute superpower mm-hmm. on the uh, on the lacrosse landscape. They're still there, but they've they've, uh, they've got a lot more competition. When I played, there were four or five titans that were on that field. That uh, I mean, any given Sunday you could you, you could win or lose, but generally, come championship weekend, there was a real small group of folks that were there, and I was lucky enough to be with one of those teams. And then really trying to figure out what I want to do next. You know, didn't know what I wanted to do when I grew up. Loved playing rough, getting into adventures. And from a bunch of reading service, really felt like the right place to start as a young man. So I wanted to be an officer. I wanted to be in uh, an elite unit and kind of did a bunch of research. And, you know, you can't go to any spot in Special Operations Command where you're not going to be with a great group of folks and and doing the missions you want to do. I just heard the attrition rate at SEAL training was uh, hovering somewhere around 80%. And that sounded like the right level of odds for me. So uh, I found a good home there. And then uh, my timing was absolutely unbelievable. You know, I got to do at least one deployment pre 9-11. So really what the SEAL teams have been for almost 30 years at that point, you know, just kind of being ready to fight, but not having a whole lot of targets to go attack. And then 9-11 unfolds. And, uh, you know, most of the world knows the history from that point on. We've been 
chasing bad guys the whole time. So it's just been a great experience. I found the right place. I think having spent time with all the other units, both conventional and special operations, I think SEALs were, was perfect for me. But any young lion that's listening and wants to go serve, you, you really can't find a bad spot. The military is incredible. So yeah, it's been a gift. And now I'm doing a lot of consulting on leadership and high performance teams and culture, talking to a lot of companies, a lot of uh, small teams, big teams, kind of making up as I go along. So it's been a lot of fun. Awesome. Cool. So you obviously have a breadth of experience. And I guess now that you're starting to transition from military to full time into the civilian sector, I guess what's been the biggest uh, challenge you faced, you know, making that transition yourself? You know this from experience in the military, both, you know, active and reserve side. You really, once you kind of come off active, that's your transition point in my mind. I mean, this finish line in, in July doesn't really affect anything I'm doing kind of in the civilian battle space. I think the transition is, I think, it's, look, it's different for everybody. I mean, I think some people leave their time on active service, you know, healthy, happy, knowing what they want to do. I think other people leave very apprehensive and not sure what they're going to do and are kind of struggling to find that thing. And then some people leave broken. That's just the the reality of it. I I feel very lucky in that I left with a lot of opportunities and I, and some of those I probably drove to, you know, purpose and and their reality. And also I'm, I'm a huge believer in kind of luck, fate and the things that happen in the world, the path that's kind of there. Um, And so I I had a great off ramp. I mean, the fact of the matter is I had gainful employment. I had interest in things I was doing, book had come out. That was early in the kind of, you know, seals being out in the public space. And and I've tried to be very, very careful about that to make sure I'm a good steward of the brotherhood and, you know, hold myself to a higher standard than the military actually holds us to in what we talk about, what we don't talk about. And you know me well enough to know I, I like talking about the higher ideals. I don't like talking about myself and me and look at, you know, we killed this many people. I killed these people. I, I really like the, the greater context of what we did as a team, which is what makes the military um, special. But for me, the transition has been great. The uh, brick walls I've run into, or at least the barriers I've run into are I'm a very disciplined person. I'm not a particularly organized person. So I I see a big difference between those two things. So for me, the military schedule was out of this world. I loved, loved, you know, I get up at 445. I'm at the team by 515. I'm dragging a razor across my face. I'm going to do jujitsu or get a workout in. I'm going to do whatever that is. And and then the schedule unfolds the rest of the day. I I very much miss that. And I do struggle even now kind of creating that schedule. I've tried to very much create a disciplined schedule because my personality does well with that. But um, it's still a challenge because every day becomes, you know, it's on me to make that happen. And the days you want to sleep in. <laughs> yeah, I know. That's, that's my, that was my biggest struggle transitioning from active to reserve was like, like we're taught discipline in the military and it's almost like I refer to it as can discipline. It's, it's just there. It's inherent. Yeah. It was a struggle for me to take a step back and then like do that all on my own without any of that command driving me to, yeah. uh, to do those types of things. But um, I want to go back to one thing that you just mentioned is you love talking about the higher ideals about leadership and those types of concepts. I guess from your standpoint, what's sorely needed in the world today with regards to that type of stuff? What are you seeing with your, I guess, your clients and the people you consult with? What's the the biggest need uh, you see in that regard? It's multifold and it's different for a lot of organizations. You know, I mean, the nice thing is I, I get to talk to a real disparate, wide ranging group of folks. So one week I'm with private equity and high end finance folks. And the next week I'm talking to a small IT solutions firm, right? That's got a, a tiny little shop and while business and leadership, leadership, I think is leadership. I, I don't think there's dramatic, dramatic um, differing requirements. There's, I think there's differing requirements as how you lead people, mm-hmm. but the, you know, the primary tenets of leadership of, of generating trust, having good judgment, um, holding the standard, exemplifying the standard and all those things. Those are, those are elemental. It doesn't matter if you're running a small organization or a huge organization. Those are, those are hugely, hugely important. I just think the world's gotten complex, you know, in that, the amount of information and the amount of kind of around the clock bombardment of both good, bad, positive, negative, curated little snippets into people's lives that, you know, you then rate yourself against no matter how much you know that's a bad thing to do. It's just omnipresent, you know, so I think young people are really wrestling with what what it means to be a man, what it means to be a young woman, you know, how you're supposed to act, how you're supposed to behave and, and how to kind of navigate this minefield of this socially connected world. And so for me, when I talk to leaders, I say, 
you know, as best he can, as often as he can, unplug, get away from that bombardment of, of external influence and pressures and, and take those moments of, of quiet and somewhat solace to make sure you're, you know, you're following your compass, you're driving your team where you want your team to go and, and you're kind of um, taking that time to get away from the noise. And I think in the military, we do a good job in that we recognize very early that it, it sounds funny coming from the military because everybody thinks it's such a machine, but this kind of holistic approach to life is actually a good thing, right? Like mind, body, and spirit. And if you, you know, you connect that spirit to religion, you can connect that spirit to purpose. But, you know, we know in the military that the, the body and the mind are connected, you know, so being fit makes you feel good and feel good makes your brain work right and vice versa, you know, so these things are, are critically important. So, you know, I, I like doing a lot of things in my training where I get people uncomfortable. We do some suffering. We do those things that were, you know, that you and I know implicitly that the hard times, are the good times, you know, that's the stuff you reflect yeah. on as opposed to trying to make everything easy. Yeah. I just, I just reconnected with a, a shipmate. Uh, you know, we've been in touch, but like I haven't had physically seen him for like 20 years. And that was the number one thing that we went back to. We were uh, search and rescue swimmers together. He actually taught me everything I needed to know about, uh, you know, getting through that training. But like the things we talked about were like, you know, when we were uh, probably out a little bit too late the night before and had to do, uh, yeah. do an open ocean swim and a five mile run. And, you know, just talking about those times when, uh, you know, those are probably the, the, the times we perform the best for those, uh, yeah. where those, uh, Nobody hungry. celebrates doing easy things, you know, yeah. and there's no reason to like you do easy stuff. You don't push yourself. You're not going to jump out of your chair and, and feel tremendous pride doing that, but you do something hard, whatever that looks like, you know, you train for a long distance race or an adventure race, or you, you know, go learn a new language, get a degree, push yourself into something that makes you uncomfortable. Those, those are the good moments. Those are the things that we all celebrate. And I think take tremendous pride and kind of, prep you for the hard things that are going to come in life. I, I tell people, I'm like, you know, I tell my kiddos, you can do hard things. And when I talk to folks, I'm like struggle and do hard things because you're never going to be able to avoid it, right? Life will catch you. I mean, either way, none of us are getting out of it alive. And most likely there's going to be some suffering thrown your way. Some people are going to deal with tremendous real deal suffering and some are going to deal with just kind of the average. Even the average can get hard. And so if you do hard things, you inoculate yourself to hard things. You're prepped for it. Yeah, do it. You do the difficult things, so life will be easy. If you try and do all the easy things, life yeah. will be difficult. Yeah, you're you're in a tough spot doing easy stuff. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. And it seems like that's kind of the theme uh, these days. We kind of we're insulated from from things like where we get our food from, oh, to yeah. keeping things, you know, keeping our, our children, quote unquote, safe. But I think by doing those things, we're doing more harm than good because, yeah. you know, we're losing touch with uh, where our food comes from and our kids are, are getting this false sense of security and they're not going to be able to handle any, any adversity. I think that's oh, yeah. Yeah. me personally. I'm not a doctor or, or, or even a uh, psychiatrist, but I think that's where a lot of these, uh, anxious disorders are coming from is because people oh, think no, yeah. things should be, should be a certain way and in reality yeah. they're not. No, they're figuring that out. I mean, I think, I think the, the research is still coming in, but I think a lot of folks are figuring out that when suicide rates are spiking precipitously, particularly among young girls and the stress, you know, you get kids that come from elite backgrounds, go to an elite school, and then they fall apart. You're like, what is going on there? You know, you had every advantage, but a kid comes from a real tough neighborhood, you know, maybe comes from, uh, you know, tough part of Texas or, you know, South Central California, they get to an elite spot and they flourish because they've been struggling the whole time. They've been grinding and clawing and trying to get up that ladder and you know we're better for it when it's easy uh it's very easy to take for granted you know even the the simple stuff and, and folks are you know particularly like you said with parents you know everybody's getting a blue ribbon everybody's a winner everybody's participating when we grow up in this life of competing against one another and such is life you know everybody's going to compete for resources in their love lives, whatever it might be, you know, you got to compete and, and, and be prepared to do that. And when, when you're not prepared to do that, have been marinated in this sauce of, you know, you're perfect, you're good. You know, it's always going to work out for you when it doesn't. Um, there's a lot of coping mechanisms that are there, you know, not at their disposal because of that. Yeah. So I know some of the work that you're doing nowadays is to create experiences to push people uh, into those uncomfortable areas out of their zone of uh, familiarity. Yeah. Um, I've come to replace the term uncomfortable with familiarity because people tend yeah. to uh, abusive relationships come to mind, but people stay stuck in these uh, familiar places. And, you know, what are some of the key components that you like to uh, put into these events to get people out of these, uh, this zone of familiarity? Yeah, I mean, you know, on the, I guess on the easiest entry, I, I do these things I call campfire sessions. So I did four last year that were kind of online 
Um, anybody could come in, you know, watch them live. And then if you bought into the, you know, campfire sessions um, through my website, you could, you could have all of them, even if you didn't attend them live, people actually came physically to campfires. And then we had people chiming in online. And this year I've kind of created a, a situation where you can basically book a campfire session. It's now a corporate team, a uh, family reunion. We've had kind of an interesting group of people that have done this, but book for me to come out, do a campfire session with you. And then, you know, the easiest entry is a campfire session, which is literally just sitting around a campfire, telling cool stories, leadership principles, life principles, culture principles, uh, a lot of question and answer and a lot of time, spend time together. And, and, you know, in the military, you know, the value of sitting around a campfire. It's just a golden yeah. thing. It brings you warmth. It brings you comfort. It's light in the dark. It's just a very, very special elemental thing. And then the way we amp it up is if you want to crank up the campfire, the campfire might be something that gets you warm after getting cold or doing something hard, you know, doing some cold water immersion, doing some struggle fest with uh you know some physical challenge that pushes you out of your comfort zone but i think these are the things when you do those they become these benchmark particularly when i do it with corporate teams i'll have a lot of companies that will book one of these and they'll do something hard as a team we'll put a premium on teamwork you know the, the seals or in the military you know you do tons of exercises that are based on if one person was doing it it'd be it'd be nearly impossible five people do it work together you can knock it out frankly make it easy if you uh, easy is not the right word but make it achievable and so we do a lot of that and then the growth that comes out of that I think the connective tissue that binds the folks that are doing it becomes special and so um, so yeah our, my experiences generally uh, connect to a certain level of suffering but that's to lead towards strength and empowerment and, and you know in the world of how hard I can make it I can make it as hard as I want but I try and make it hard enough that you get uncomfortable but uh, not break you we can create the break one. If somebody wants to break, we can, we, we, we can, we can meet that requirement. <laughs> awesome. So I guess what's been the biggest, like running these for several years here, what's been the biggest surprise aha moment that someone has had that you've worked with? Like what's been the biggest thing that you, unexpected yeah. thing that has come out of it? I think the thing that's fun is, is, is when you do those, you kind of strip people down a little bit and you kind of get to, you know, their problems or their strengths or maybe the combination of the two um, that leads to real breakthrough type moments. You know, I mean, I've had folks that I mentored that, you know, if you line people up, this is the exact same as elite level training. It certainly was in SAR. I have no doubt. You had a whole bunch of folks. And if you tried to peg who's going to make it, who's going to excel, a bunch of people probably made a liar out of you either way. The person you thought that was going to excel that fell apart and the person that you thought had no chance that ends up becoming an absolute lion. Um, I love seeing those moments. You know, some of those people know they're a lion, even though they don't look like it. And some people don't. The most fun is finding the people that don't. You find somebody that doesn't think they have it in them. And I don't know, you figure out a way to light a fire or somewhere through the process, something ignites inside them. And then you see a totally different being. And, and if that becomes one of those trajectory changing moments, that's like, if I get one of those a year, man, it was worth my year. We've, we've got a lot more than that. So that is a lot of fun to be in the presence of somebody that something you did, you know, either broke something or, or opened a pathway for them to uh, perform at a higher level. And it's just, it's just good stuff. That's probably the number one thing that I'm going to miss about the military is, is helping facilitate those aha moments, those breakthrough moments for someone in their career, whether it's, whether it's advancement or physical achievements or, or other things, seeing other people succeed on based at least in part by the influence you had on them is yeah. I haven't experienced that outside the military quite, quite at the same level yet. No, so that's awesome. That's awesome. So it, it sounds like you are, you like to break things down into simple parts. And like you mentioned before, this world tends to be overcomplicated with a mass amount of information being bombarded at ourselves on a daily basis here. So what are some of the tactics aside from uh, unplugging that you use to kind of filter what makes it to, uh, I guess, to your two eyes and into your brain? I think people have a sense that to get better, to improve, to perform at a high level, that it takes lots of things or a stack or a big spread of things to achieve that end state. And, and what I think most people that train and discipline themselves towards high levels of performance, they recognize that there's a small number of things you need to do really well to perform at a high level. So it's, it's rare that there's, we could probably come up with a thing that takes just staggering levels of multitasking and, and unbelievable layered levels of experience and expertise to get 
a uh, high level performance. I think those, you know, doctor probably falls resolutely in that category. The, you know, the systems they need to understand, the interactions with drugs they need to understand, that the, you know, all the different um, variables that they need to account for. That's that's probably one of those disciplines that falls resolutely into that. For the most part, that is not required. And, and I would bet even if you talk to a doctor, they're like, look, as I'm doing brain surgery, there's only one place I can cut at a time. So that's the singular focus in that moment. And that's what they're going to, you know, do well and do the best of their ability. So my, my sense is I've, I've really pulled that people think they need to do 100% better to get better. And that's not even close to it. I mean, if you look at the great performers, you know, how much better was Michael Jordan than everybody in the NBA when he played? He was better. There's no argument that in that era, he was the best player in the league. And that's, that's one of the few eras where you have a singular player where there's, it's just jury's out. This is the best player in the league. And I think you don't see that as much. But when, when it's the case, you know, is, is he 50% better? No possible way with how good all the people he's performing with. Is it 10? Is it five? It's probably somewhere in that range. I bet it's like three to 5% that he was better, whether on how much he worked harder or his performance um, are small degrees of, of, of better. So when I try and, you know, mentor folks or teach folks or work with people I'm like, look, don't try and attack everything, attack one thing, you know, maybe either one weakness or improve a strength that's really going to get you where you need to be. Um, focus on that discipline, that habit, that single source thing you need to do to improve yourself and you can probably handle that and then if you do it well you're going to get it to a level of mastery or a high level of performance when you can move on to number two or number three or number four you try and do all five at once you're going to dilute the pool and unlikely get it all achieved you do one thing really well you're going to improve and so I, I like that simplicity and I wish I saw that from you know even our senior leaders I mean when you're looking at you know we know this from the military so I'll, I'll use that as an example it would be the same thing for a president a senator or some senior leader in a business I, I remember when senior leaders you know at every command you only got a small number of time in the military to be at that command and get change or things accomplished right so for an officer it's, it's two years maybe right. it goes three years so you inherit from the guy you're relieving or the gal you're relieving probably a, 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 a unbelievable list of needs. And then you're going to pass that on to the next person because you're not going to get them all done. I've seen multiple leaders get nothing done because they tried to get all 15 items done off the dream sheet. Mm. And then they just passed it to the next leader. And I, I used to tell leaders that I was even supported by, look, let's get one, maybe two things done in this two year period. And it, look, the stack you're going to pass to the next person is going to be two items less. That's good things. I mean, if you told me tomorrow I got to be president or, you know, king of the world, I would tell people in a four-year period, I'm going to get one major accomplishment and I'm going to shoot for two. I'm not even going to look at number three because they're not going to do it. You just, you can just see that people don't get things done because they're trying to do too much. And if you can focus in on one and slay that dragon, you're going to, you're going to move on to good things. Yeah, I can't agree with you more. I mean, I've got uh, I've got two businesses I'm starting, and you know the temptation is there to, ooh, this person's doing this uh, doing this little scheme over here, or or go after that shiny object that I call I like to call it, and that's really important, and it's something that we we talk about on this podcast here a ton is like really focusing in, really sticking to your plan, but yet staying fluid enough to, you know, take advantage of opportunities as they do arise, if they make sense and, and fit in with the, the grand picture. Speaking of which, um, how do you help uh, people craft that, that vision so that they can stay focused? Is that something that you uh, help your clients with? Yeah, I try and be careful about becoming a problem solver. And I say that not to duck, you know, you know the, the deal. There's huge multi-gazillion dollar consulting firms that make their entire living off coming in and supposedly solving your problems. The thing is, I've seen that play out. And what I've generally found is company X that does that interviews the company from the toes to nose, takes all their suggestions and fixes, then packages in a beautiful leather bound piece of, you know, data and gives it back to them. I don't, I don't think the consultants really thought of a single solution whatsoever. It was all self, it was all self generated, you know, and, and, and like I said, companies have made billions and millions of dollars doing this. So I try and be a realist that if I'm one, I'm working with two diverse a population to say, I can solve all your problems or, or, or be arrogant enough to think that I'm probably going to know what you're dealing with better than you are. There's times when I've done a deep dive, either at a campfire session or an executive session, where I've seen some very obvious things. And I've, I've told leaders, hey, I, I can tell you without question, this needs to happen. 
uh, you know, from my opinion, I think if you do this, you know, get rid of this part of your organization, streamline, you know, your focus when it comes to an individual project, um, change the way you structure meetings, change the way you structure communication, th those things are going to help you perform. So more than saying, I'm going to fix a problem, I try and give you tools to do it yourself because I'm not going to be there, right? I don't want a job doing a deep dive with a company for a year. It's not my interest. I would much rather have a couple touch points and say, this is how you can do it. Because in the end, if, if, if I have to fix it, you're probably in trouble anyway, unless you hire me full time. And all of a sudden, I'm in charge of the place, which I'm not, I'm not looking to do, um, you know, right now. So uh, that, that's the way I try and look at it is I try and give tools, you know, kind of um, to, to sharpen their sword more than, you know, fix something or, or, or do the work for them. So that's, that's the real focus is saying, hey, you know, maybe, maybe look at this individual piece of the puzzle, maybe think about it this way. But I've found usually the organization knows better than I do how they're going to, you know, solve their problems. Yeah, it's, it's empowering people to solve problems all on their own instead of you going in and solving that problem. And, and yep. you know, being in the military, it's all about training your replacement, training people to uh, essentially replace you and make yourself obsolete. Yeah. And uh, the best outcome is uh, those people never need you ever again. You know, that was something that uh, something I focused on and works really well. So if you're, if you're in a position where you're, where you're leading people, where you are influencing people, that's definitely uh, something uh, you want to uh, want to bring on board and, and put, put in the back of your mind is like, Hey, is what I'm doing uh, going to support this person and empower them to essentially not need me anymore. And, you know, I, I think that's, uh, that's a marker of a good leader. No doubt. So we're starting to bump up against time here. I wanted to uh, shift gears here a little bit, make sure we had enough time to, uh, you know, we've talked a lot about uh, strategy and, and uh, leadership tools here. Definitely want to dig into, uh, you know, what other work you've done, such as your book. And uh, I know you've been in the uh, movie Active Valor. What was, uh, where did these opportunities come from? And, you know, how'd you get involved with those? Yeah, uh, couple? Of course. You know, Active Valor was a real unique project. I was, uh, all of us that participated in that movie, we were on active duty. So we were still actively serving in the SEAL teams. Mm. All the people that are pulled to, to make that film were at our training command because we're a non-deployable um, position for a block of time. Uh, they really tried to find what, what had happened was we were basically in a recruiting depression where we we're actually losing more guys out the back end um, of the SEAL teams that were getting the right number of guys in to kind of plus up and, you know, like you said, replace uh, replace positions and fill your boots as you move on to the next wave of things. So uh, they, they really looked at that movie as an opportunity, not as a pure recruiting effort, but to maybe highlight authentically who we are, what we believe in and what we're kind of all about. And that might, that might prove to nudge some folks or maybe uh, spark some people to serve. And it, it, it absolutely did. There's a lot of other efforts that were layered in on top of that, but you know, our, our numbers went through the roof after that movie premiered. So um, they asked a bunch of us to participate in, the, in this film. We all said, no, not what we do, not what anybody's going to do. Nobody's going to say yes. And as we went through the process of kind of seeing how the, the, the film crew is going to make the film, they really did want to pay homage and respect to the actual events within our organization that make our culture strong and very capable on the battlefield, what it means to our families, to relationships and all those type things. So then it became a little more interesting. Uh, and so we, we kind of weighed in knowing that if, if the right guys didn't do it in some ways, the wrong guys probably from the community would say yes. Those that already had the Facebook page and want to be actors and all that stuff. You know, I haven't been on movies since I don't have a desire to do that. I've done some TV stuff. If it's, if it's got the right spirit and the right direction where hopefully it moves the needle for somebody, I'm interested in those conversations. I'm not interested to just do it, to do it. So, um, that, that's how that movie came to be, and um, it was pretty wild to make what we thought was going to be a small recruiting film and it becomes the number one movie in America and a big theater release. Uh, very, very strange experience, but not, nothing but positive um, when it comes to the, in general, reaction, certainly of the public and, and the teams, I think, um, have real mixed feelings, and, and I, I don't uh, begrudge anybody that feels either positive or negative about it, um, but we were put on orders to do it, and we did the best of our, our, our abilities. And then the book, I really, I'm a reader, and uh, I love to write. Um, read and write much more than math and science and that stuff. So um, I knew I'd write, you know, as I, I had something to write about when I came off active duty, I felt like I had some stories to tell. And, and, you know, as we discussed much more, these are the higher ideals. These are the things we believe in. Hopefully this is something that helps move the needle for you and, and, and can be something that, uh, you know, maybe plants a seed with a young lion that might not have thought about service otherwise. And, and that would uh, be a catalyst for them to do so. And that that's proven true. A lot of feedback from folks, right. Be saying, Hey, I read your book. 
I'm going to go serve. And that's, that's a gift of gifts because I feel like that's paying it forward. A book started my career. If mine starts somebody else's, that's just a great way to keep the, keep the cycle going. But um, great experiences both. Um, and and uh, I'll write more. I've, I've got two books. Damn Few is my first one. Worth Dying For is my second book. I'll write more, but I don't like writing them to write them. It's enough work that uh, I only want to do it if it's purposeful and I'm kind of circling on what that, that next effort should be. Awesome. A lot of military veteran authors, especially the uh, special forces get a lot of flack for, you know, writing books and talking about their experiences. But I I really think it's, uh, it it would be a shame if, if we kept that stuff to ourselves. I mean, we serve, we came home alive and and we, you know, did a service. But I think if we uh, keep this experience and the things that we learned, you know, locked inside of us, uh, we're doing society a, a disservice. I think there's a lot of good that can be uh, put out to uh, society to improve things. And, and just like the things that we talked about here, pushing people out of their comfort zones and getting people to uh, think for themselves a lot more. And, and, you know, everything that we talked about here, it, I think is sorely needed. So I appreciate yeah. uh, the work that you have did. I definitely have uh, these books in, in my uh, e-reader queue. I haven't, honestly, I haven't read them yet, but yeah. you know, there's so much, so much good content out there. It's hard to uh, get it all digested all at once here, but uh, definitely going to read those books. Uh, you also have a website, uh, you know, if people are interested in getting involved with these campfire sessions and yeah. if there's a corporate client out there uh, that's listened to this, how can they uh, reach out to you? Yeah, so RourkeDenver.com, all, all one word, RourkeDenver, all together.com, takes you to my site. I've created a brand that I, I call Ever Onward. I signed all my emails in the military onward just to, as, just to have this kind of uh, feel of moving forward and, and, and advancing, which I think, you know, the best military forces and teams do. Uh, so it's called Ever Onward. If you go to that site, it's got a bunch of my content. I'll have this podcast and all the others I've done, you know, there. So you can listen to that, kind of get a sense of what I believe in and, and, and what I like talking about. And then there's an entire drop down window of kind of how to find me and offerings that we have. So campfire sessions are one. Uh, we've got a couple other that are, that are up and coming soon. Uh, I do this uh, uh, cultures fellowship uh, that goes every fall with a couple other big, big leaders uh, out in New Mexico. That's a great way to engage. There's just lots of neat ways to engage, either a private speaking event, big stage speaking event, or one of these kind of curated campfire sessions or an experience. And that can all be found at, uh, at RourkeDenver.com. And then I'm awesome. starting to, the social media side is not something um, I'm naturally, uh, I guess, attracted to, but it's real. It's how people are taking in information. So, you know, Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, all that stuff. I've really been hitting LinkedIn and LinkedIn and Instagram to start telling more stories and so that's a that's another good place to find me just with my name awesome right on well definitely put all those links and social media contact information uh in the show notes here so people uh, don't have an excuse to miss that type of stuff before we wrap up here is there one last uh golden nugget that maybe we didn't get to uh drop here that maybe you want to share I just think it's really being purposeful in, in what you're doing and, and to really find purpose in what you're doing. I've been talking to a couple of friends lately that are transitioning and, and some other folks that are kind of, you know, kind of at this middle, middle towards the maybe third quarter of, of their kind of professional careers. And I've seen a lot of people that are super unhappy doing what they're doing. There's also being an adult, which is doing what you have to do. So, you know, if you got to do a tough job to keep the lights on, keep your kiddos fed and, and keep things moving forward, do that. Uh, while you're doing that, pursue something. And you know, sometimes I think it gets over talked this like, Oh, just pursue your passion. There are some passions that are not going to lead to <laughs> lead to any level of, of success or maybe gain at the same time. I'd probably rather be doing a, a, a less than stellar passion than just grinding for, for a dollar or to get some end state that probably is going to make me happy anyway. So I would just say, you know, try and figure out a way in your professional life to be purposeful in what you're doing. If you can't do that, find something that you're purposeful about in your off time, whether that's a hobby, service, volunteering, or doing things like that. That's the good stuff. That's just where we just make this whole experiment that in the, is this country, which those of us that fought for it care greatly and deeply for. That's the way to make the experiment move forward. If you don't, you're, you're, just, you're just dragging it down. Awesome. Great stuff, man. Well, again, I appreciate your time and uh, definitely look forward to staying in touch with you and uh, getting, this, uh, getting this out to the world because this has uh, been some excellent stuff. Thanks again. No, I appreciate it. Thanks, brother. Thank you for tuning in to the Zero Excuses podcast. Join the conversation at KenyanZitzka.com in our Facebook group. And don't forget to rate and subscribe to our show. We'll talk to you next week. And always remember, results, not excuses.